Hello and good evening. Welcome to this British Taekwondo Sport Taekwondo webinar, looking at major rule changes for sport Taekwondo. My name is Richard Gottfried, Marketing, Digital and Media Manager at British Taekwondo. And this evening's session will be run by Jody Sinden, uh, Referee Director. Um, and in the session, we'll be learning how the new World Taekwondo rules will be implemented and the timelines we'll be working towards. So I'd like to pass over to uh, Jody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, it's great to see you all joining us for these um, rule changes. Um, we're going to just go through um, the rule changes, um, go through the presentation. I ask if you've got any questions, I'm sure there will be plenty of questions. Um, jot them down in the chat and um, save them till the end. We're going to save all the questions till right at the end because it might be that the question that you're going to ask will be answered on the next slide. So um, if you guys can just bear with me, listen to the presentation, listen to the rule changes, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, I do just want to say um, these rule changes that we're giving to you today, this is how these are the very latest um, interpretations of the World Taekwondo rule changes. Um, if you saw the document that was leaked a couple of months ago, of the proposed changes, a lot of things have changed since then. Um, a lot of things have evolved um, from various competitions. And so whatever you might have seen before, what you hear today is how it's going to be, um, how we're going to be implementing the rule changes in British Taekwondo um, and the most up-to-date um, sort of message from World Taekwondo as well. So um, don't worry if you think that you hear something different today to what you maybe thought. Um, chances are it's changed because quite a lot of things have changed even from a couple of months ago. <clears throat> so just to start, um, why have the rules changed? Um, well, at the end of every Olympic cycle, World Taekwondo does this. They review everything that they thought went well, everything that they thought that they think um, could have gone better and how they want to change things um, going forward for the next Olympic cycle. So we expected, um, we had no major rule changes from um, 2020 until now. We expected a major rule change to be coming up um, and this is sort of what we're seeing. So um, the impact of Tokyo, the things that they didn't really like from Tokyo were um, 10 to 15 calios per round, which was around 90 seconds delay per match. Um, too much passivity, too much clinching to avoid play, um, too much front leg fencing, um, yeah. games not running to schedule because of golden round. Um, yeah. So I just ask that um, everyone is on mute, thank you. Um, so games not running to schedule because of the golden round, adding in an extra round where they potentially weren't expecting it. Um, and then a lot of matches lacking a technical exchange in the last few seconds of the final round. We've all seen it. Someone's winning by a couple of points. There's five seconds left and they run out of the ring. So they're trying, um, they sort of looked at all these things. Don't get me wrong, Tokyo 2020 was great. It was a brilliant showcase for our sport. Um, but watching it, World Tech Wonder like, well, what were the bits that we weren't so keen on and what can we do better? Um, so these were the things that they wanted to improve. Um, and then the aim of the new rules is just to make the game more engaging and exciting with fewer interruptions. So uh, we're going to kick off by looking at the cadet categories. This is one major change that we've seen and something that sort of threw everybody into a spin. Um, World Taekwondo are going to be moving away from traditional weight categories. They've done quite a lot of research into um, child development and um, weight-based sports for children. And the, what, what they're thinking now is to stop children extreme dieting by moving from traditional weight categories to height range categories. So we're going to talk about what that means. I know there's been quite a lot of confusion over it. Um, it is a massive change. It is something that we're going to have to get our heads around. Um, so it's a height range category with a maximum weight. Um, BT event hosts, um, for the time being, while we're sort of in this transitionary period with cadet categories um, we're going to let event hosts choose um, whether they're going to use heights or the traditional weight categories as they were um, as we're used to seeing them so for the time being we're going to have 
a choice. Um, Cadet Worlds this year, as far as I'm aware, is going to be sticking with traditional weights. Um, so World Taekwondo are phasing this in gradually as well. <clears throat> so what do what does it actually mean? Um, we've seen these ranges and thought, well, I don't really fit into these categories. Well, um, if you are for like this example, under 64 centimetres, so you've got to be um, over 160 centimetres and not exceeding 164 centimetres, and you can be any weight up to 56 kilograms. So if you're under 164 centimetres and 45 kilos, that's fine. Um, 50 kilos, fine. Anything up to 56 kilos in that height bracket and you're fine. If you're 63 kilos or anything above 56, um, you would have to go up into the next height category. Um, so there's a maximum height and a maximum weight. Uh, we're not saying that someone who is 162 centimetres and 62 kilos can't compete. They can compete, they'll just have to compete in a higher category. Um, so they can't exceed the max weight, there's, but there's no minimum weight for a height category. Um, I'm sure there's questions on this and if you have, pop them in the chat and we'll talk about them at the end. <clears throat> so the actual game, how's the actual game changed? Um, you might have seen, um, competitions that have happened over the last couple of months we're moving away from a final point score system where it's the total points at the end of three rounds to a best of three round system so world taekwondo were kind of trialing this in the last couple of years um, at the grand slams and now they're bringing it into just world taekwondo rules so it'll become a best of three rounds um, so every round will have a winner um, there can't be any tied rounds and the first competitor to win two rounds will be declared the winner. So some matches will end after two rounds if the same person wins the first and the second. Some will go to three rounds if it's 1-1 one, one, and then on to the third. Um, the referee will declare a winner at the end of each round. They'll do that by pointing um, to the side for the player, either um, Chung or Hong. Um, so you'll know who has won each round going into the next round. What it means is each round re resets completely, um, begins at zero, zero, no gam jumps from the previous round are carried over. It's a complete reset. Anything that happened in that previous round is sort of done with um, and is no longer relevant beyond having um, a winner and a loser for that round. It also means we no longer have a golden point round. There will never be a fourth round of a competition. There will, the most anyone will ever fight is three rounds. Um, and like I said, sometimes two. <clears throat> so we've said you've got to win a round. Obviously there's different, just as there's different ways you can win a match right now, there's different ways you can win a round. Um, so the most simple, straightforward way that you can win a round um, is simply just by having more points at the end of the round. Um, you can also win by achieving a 12 point gap at any point in the round. So any point in the round, if you, you're 12 points ahead of your opponent, you the round ends where it is and you will win. <clears throat> will Taekwondo aren't using the point gap um, in senior semi-finals and finals, um, just like they didn't use point gap before. Um, for us at BT, we will continue using a 12 point gap across all matches and categories, just at the chief referee's discretion. So on the morning of an event, they'll let you know whether we're using point gap um, in semi-finals and finals. World Taekwondo don't do it because it messes up their TV scheduling. Obviously for us at an event, um, in the UK, we, we're not on TV, we don't have to run to those schedules, um, so we, it's something that the chief referee might decide to keep in. <clears throat> if you get five gam jumps in a round, you'll automatically lose that round, so um, five gam jumps and you automatically lose, and then the round score will be recorded as it is at that fifth gam jump, so you might be winning 10-4, um, but then you get that fifth gam jump. Um, regardless of the score, the other person wins that round. What it does mean is obviously before it was 10 gam jumps across three rounds. Now it's 
five per round so there is scope for players to get a few more gam jumps than they used to um without being disqualified but obviously it's capped now um at the five per round <clears throat> so just a scenario then on um that ga those gam jumps um so say both players are on four gam jumps and both commit a fifth offense almost simultaneously um for example if blue falls and red crosses the boundary line at a approximately the same time um, it's up to the referee the centre referee basically to know which happened first and to give the gam jump to the player that they believe committed the offence first and then that player will be the loser because at the point of that offence um, that round ends obviously you guys as coaches um, can appeal with IVR if you've got an IVR quota because you can always ask for gam jumps for your player to be removed so if that situation occurs that is something that you can ask for to be double checked so we've gone through the sort of straightforward bits that you know just you've won on points you've won on gap you've won because the other person's got too many gam jumps what happens then in matches where we've got a tied score um if the score is tied if it's a draw the winner of the round will be decided by criteria similar in a similar way to how it used to be decided um, in golden point so it's the first criteria met from the following so the total points scored by spinning kicks um, if one person scored three spinning headshots and the other person got all of their points from standard headshots and body shots the person who scored points from spinning techniques will win if that's the same, if both people scored the same amount of spinning techniques or the same amount of, um, or neither scored any spinning techniques, um, it goes on to the higher point value techniques. So who scored the most headshots? Um, if that's tied, who scored more two point shots opposed to punches, etc. So it goes down in that sort of hierarchy where they're trying to encourage people to score more points essentially um with with these high value techniques they're encouraging not score more points sorry they're encouraging people to throw more spinning kicks throw more headshots make the game more exciting so um if it comes to a tie it's those points that take sort of higher precedent if all of that's still the same we go down to hits registered by the pss so these near misses um who had more near misses in the match <clears throat> and if that is still tied, then we go on to superiority Use Karak. So that is exactly the same as it's always been superiority, um, as we would have had it at the end of Golden Point round. But now it's at the end of every tied round, if everything else has been the same. So those first three points, the PSS system and um, the Dado will... Um, automatically tell us a winner and um, it's only if everything's tied that it'll then go to the judges and they'll have to decide so if it goes to the judges if the judges have to decide um it's based on the same use Karak um superiority system as it's always been it's um again they look at the first one if that's tied they go on to the second tied again onto the third etc so it's the judge's decision based on aggressive match management greater number of techniques so who was kicking more um more advanced techniques who was throwing more back kicks who was throwing more headshots even if they weren't connecting um and then finally better competition manner who was more polite who wasn't giving the referee attitude every time they got a gam drum etc so it is quite important obviously we do um, teach our players etiquette anyway but um, your match could very well come down to it. Um, it this will be decided um, by the three judges if there are three judges um, if there's two judges it's the two judges plus the centre referee so it's always three people that decide and um, it'll either be three judges and the centre referee won't be involved or two judges plus the centre referee and they'll announce that for everyone to see um, simultaneously the referee will um, count and then they'll all signal to which player um, 
they're voting for for the round so it'll be nice and transparent everybody will see how everyone how everyone's voting <coughs> Going on to look at instant video replay. This is something all you coaches will um, probably be very interested in. Um, you can now ask for any head kick which is not registered on the PSS. So any head kick at all that's not registered on PSS, you can now use your IVR card to ask for. Um, it includes kicks to the face, um, to the head guard anything from above the chin remember um below the chin the neck isn't a scoring area um, you won't get a gam drum for kicking the neck but you also won't score so just be aware of that um it's anything from above the chin any part of the head um head guard or face um the review juror um will only check that there was contact from the foot to the scoring area um the level of impact or other factors are irrelevant so all they will look at is whether that foot made contact. Um, if the referee has given a gam drum, obviously you wouldn't get the points. It wouldn't be worth playing your cards because if they've given the gam drum for grabbing, for example, and then you're asking for a headshot, um, they've given a gam drum for grabbing. But if they haven't given a gam drum for grabbing, even if the review juror sees the grabbing, you will still get the points because that's the referee's mistake, not yours. Um, coaches can ask for a headshot if a referee counts. So if a referee sees a strong head kick um, that hasn't, well, whether it's scored or not, a strong impact to the head, the referee will count. If it hasn't scored, the referee should play their own card. Um, but if they don't, for whatever reason, they've forgotten, you can, as a coach, now play your card for those points. Um, and whether those points are added or not, you will get your card back in that instance because the referee should have used their card and you're playing yours because of their mistake. Um, obviously, in the other instances, if you've played just for a, a head kick that hasn't been counted for and it, the review jury disagrees, um, for example, it's a kick with the shin not with the foot you will lose it it's just in that instance where the referee counts <clears throat> another change um in terms of ivr is not so much for coaches but just for your awareness corner judges can now request ivr um for technical points so they cannot ask for headshots um but what they can do is ask for the addition um or removal of technical points so if one presses um, for a spinning technique but the other two don't see it um, that corner judge can request IVR if the coach doesn't have their card to play for themselves um, so if you can play your own card then that is up, it's up to you to play your card but if you've had your card taken off you the corner judges can now ask for IVR <clears throat> spinning kicks then um, so the sort of World Taekwondo have cracked down now on what actually the definition of a turning kick, spinning kick is. So in the rule book, it's they're always referred to turning kicks, uh, referred to as turning kicks, sorry. Um, we in the UK tend to refer to them as spinning kicks. So it means a turning motion. So it has to be a spin of the body. So a back kick, reverse turning kick. It can't just be a partial turn. Um, the shoulders and head need to rotate along with the legs you can't just sort of throw your leg backwards um without that spin off the body um if it's not um you can as a coach play your card if you if someone has been awarded points for a spinning kick and you don't think it was a spin you don't think the head and shoulders turned with the body um with the legs sorry then you can play your card for that um so the head and shoulders need to rotate as well. <clears throat> Looking at clinching then, so this is another bit where we've seen sort of a major change. Um, just in general, um, referee, in fact, I'll come to that in a minute. So when 
competitors clinch or close down, um, the referee won't be stepping in and Calioing immediately anymore. So we're used to Calio after one second. That won't be happening. What will happen instead is as soon as those players go into the clinch, the referee will come in with the fight. And then it's up to the players. They've got three seconds to separate themselves. Um, they can you know, just separate. They can kick out. They can fight out. But they've got to separate themselves within those three seconds. If they don't, if they're still in the clinch after three seconds, the referee will give a gam jump to one or both of them. So they'll give a gam jump to the player who's holding or grabbing and in this case we class holding or grabbing as arms past the opponent's body so as soon as the referee comes in and says fight the arms need to be coming away because after those three seconds if the arms are still there you will get a gam jump for holding or grabbing um or if, it, if neither are holding and grabbing um but they're still in the clinch the referee will give a gam jump to the more passive player so if one's trying to get out um, trying to kick out but the other one's just constantly still closing them down following them that player who's trying to stay in the clinch rather than engage will get a gam jump obviously if the referee sees um, obvious grabbing after one second they will come in sooner and give the gam jump um, but after three seconds someone is getting a gam jump if you're still in the clinch so your players need to really be getting it into their heads, getting into the habit of after the referee says fight, we need to be getting ourselves out of the clinch. Another change to um, the way clinching sort of works, the way we look at clinching um, is in animal kicks. So when we're in the clinch, so body to body, we can't kick um, to the body or the back of the head with the side or bottom of the foot. So it used to just be we couldn't do the monkey, scorpion, fish kicks to the body. It's now being extended to we can't do those kicks to the body or to the head. So any kicks, a bit like in this picture, so this is like a scorpion kick to the back of the head. This wouldn't be allowed. You would get a gam jump for this from the clinch. Um, crescent kicks though, so you're in a clinch and you throw a crescent kick to the side of the head is absolutely fine. So crescent kicks to the side of the head are still allowed. What's not allowed is these animal kicks. So monkey kicks coming up to the back of the head, um, scorpion kicks, fish kicks to body or head. Um, if you throw these kicks from the clinch and there's any sort of contact um, to the body or to the head, regardless of whether it scores, you will get the gam jump. If it scores, obviously the points will come off as well. <clears throat> Going on then to avoiding, there's been some changes, not so much changes actually with avoiding, just more clarity. Um, so one aspect of avoiding that's not actually written down on this slide is now, like um, we just talked about in the clinch with the referee stepping in and saying fight, the referee, um, if there's passivity near the players kicking, after three seconds now, they will come in and say fight instead of after five. And then it's a further three. So it used to be five seconds fight and then another five seconds. Now it's three seconds fight and a further three seconds. And again, just like in the clinch, someone will get a warning if there's been no technical engagement. When we talk about avoiding, and then I'll tell you sort of what we class as technical engagement, um, as well. If you're avoiding moving three paces backwards or sideways without technical engagement with the opponent, you'll get a gam jump. So before it was just a gam jump for three steps backwards. Now they've broadened that and said actually it's three steps backwards or sideways, sort of any way, any direction that's disengaging with the match, any direction that's not forwards, basically. Um, without technical engagement, you will get a gam jump. So one step, one shift, um, one shuffle back is a pace, regardless of the distance that you've travelled. It's whether it's a big step or whether it's just a little shuffle. Um, it's that sliding motion or that step is classed as one pace. Being kicked doesn't count as technical engagement. We've all seen it. Sort of one player's constantly moving backwards, but because the other player was following and kicking them, um, no one gets a gam jump. If one player is moving forwards and kicking and the other player is just moving backwards and goes backwards three steps. Um, 
whether they're being kicked or not, they will get a gamjum. They need to engage themselves. They need to throw some kicks themselves, move forward. They can be moving backwards as they throw those kicks, but they need to initiate some sort of engagement. So just being kicked yourself doesn't count. If you're pushed backwards, that doesn't count as you moving a step backwards. Um, and it's not avoiding the match either. So you being pushed, obviously that's out of your control. You're not going to get penalised for that. Um, closing down does count as an engagement. So if you initiate a clinch, um, but only if you initiate that clinch, you move forward into that clinch. <clears throat> So between rounds, then obviously we talked about earlier, we talked about every round must have a winner. You can only get four gam jumps in a round and that fifth one will make the other player win the round. So five gam jumps and you'll lose. Um, so it becomes quite important now if you commit a prohibited act between the rounds where that gam jump goes, because obviously it could then influence the outcome of that round. So if your offence occurs within five seconds of the completion of the round, it'll go on the previous round score. So the most likely example of this is the referee comes in with Guman um, to end the round and there's an attack after Calio. That attack after Calio will go on that previous round, the round that's just finished score and could change the outcome of it. If it's after five seconds, so you, you the players have gone back to the coaches, um, maybe the players have gone back to the coaches and one of them swears or they don't come back to start the next round when they're called, then that gam jump for misconduct will go on to the next round score. So just to be aware of that, well, how that can influence and change um, the outcome of rounds. Falling down then, so there's been a few changes to falling down. So just as before, it's a gam jump if any part of the body other than the sole of the foot touches the floor. So if you fall down, you'll get a gam jump, except if you fall following a scoring spinning technique. So you throw like this picture, a reverse hook kick, it scores and you fall down, then you will not get a gam jump. If it doesn't score, then you will get a gam jump. So if it misses, it doesn't score, you'll get a gam jump for falling, even though you've thrown a spinning technique. The only way you won't get a gam jump is if you fall after you've scored a spinning technique to the body or to the head. Pushing has changed slightly. So... Um, just as before, um, you aren't allowed to push um, in a way that prevents the other person from kicking or attacking. You can't push someone while they're kicking. Um, you can't push someone over the boundary line. That's not changed. Um, what has changed is you can get a gam jump for continuous pushing or prolonged continuous contact. So pushing should basically just be used to gain space. It should be a short push and then hands off. Um, it shouldn't be shoving someone all the way around the ring. Um, it's a short push and then hands off, a quick impact, um, so to speak. So that's just the change there. Lifting the leg um, has changed again slightly. Um, so a lot of it hasn't changed. So lifting the leg to block, you'll get a gam jump for. Um, lifting the leg to impede the opponent you'll get a gam jump for. Um, what has changed is now if you do three kicks in the air without putting the foot down, you will get a gam jump. So before you could have, you could kick as many times as you wanted in three seconds. Now it has been changed to three kicks. So three kicks and you will get a gam jump. So after this, you can do one, two, and the foot must go down. If you do one, two, and then score on the third kick, that kick will be invalidated and you will get a gam jump. So it's one, and then the second one has to be the scoring kick, or one, two, foot down, and then go again. 
So we can't do three kicks in the air. We can't hold our leg in the air for three or more seconds. That's pretty hard to do without actually kicking. Um, so yeah, the big change here is this three kicks in the air will get you a gam jump. <clears throat> Finally then, um, we're just going to talk about random weighing. Um, it's not something that we've used so far in the UK, but we are going to be using a random weighing for the cadet selection events coming up. Um, and then going forward, it is something that might get introduced at nationals as well. Um, but especially if you've got players um, doing the cadets um, selection events, it will be used there just to prepare athletes for what it'll be like at the cadet worlds. So it's changed um, the number of athletes that get tested in the random weighing um, is going to increase to up to 20% of athletes in a weight category, dependent on how many are in the group. So if there's less than four players in the group, no one will be asked to attend the random weighing. Um, if there's four to eight, then two people will be randomly selected. Um, nine to 16, then four people will be randomly selected. 17 to 32, then eight people will be randomly selected. And then if over 32, um, it'll just be 20% of the total number of players in that category that will be randomly selected to attend the random weigh-in. So um, that brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, I would like to open it up now to any questions that have come through the chat. Um, any questions, if you thought of any questions now, then please do pop them into the chat. How this is going to work um, is Rick, our operations manager, is going to read through your questions, put them to me, and I'll do my best to answer them for you. <clears throat> oh, hi there. So just looking at some of the questions, I think with some of these, the questions were asked before you'd given an answer on the particular area, but I'm going to go over these anyway, just to make sure um, that we've got these covered. So uh, one of the questions here is what if the scores are tied at the end of a round? I think you've already covered it, but if you could just for clarity, just cover that, please, Jodie. Yeah, I'll just flick back. So if the scores are tied um, at the end of the round, then we go through a set criteria. So it's the first criteria met. So if we meet the first one, then the rest don't matter. If it's still tied, we go down to the next one, for example. So it'll be the total points scored by spinning techniques um, is the first criteria that we'll look at. If that's tied, we go on to higher point value techniques. So who scored more headshots as opposed to body shots, etc. moving down. Um, if that's still tied, we look at hits registered by the PSS. And if that's all still tied, it goes to the judge's decision, Usay Karak. That's great. Thanks, Jodie. So next one is um, if we throw two kicks which score and then a third kick that that also scores and you get a gam jump, does this mean that the three scoring techniques will also be invalidated? So this is around the leg goes up with kick um, three times. Let's say all three score. Tell, tell us what happens. It's the third. So it, it would be the third kick that would be invalidated. You wouldn't lose those first two. Um, it's just that third one. Um, what happens if you knock the opponent out with a third kick then? If you knock the opponent out with that third kick, then you'll get the gam jump because you shouldn't, you can, you're you only allowed the two kicks and then the opponent will win if the um, medics say that they can't continue. It's just like, just like any other gam jump offence. Um, if the other person can't continue because you've done something that you'll get a gam jump for, they'll win. It's harsh, it's horrible, it's how it is. Okay, doke. So next quick here, uh, quick next question here is: At which point in the event will a random weigh-in take place? Okay, um, so a random weigh-in always occurs on the morning of the event. So um, <clears throat> the random weigh-in is publicised at like half past six in the morning, which pl which players. Um, will need to come down for the random weigh-in. So it's rammed, it is, to as the name suggests, totally random. Um, it's not picked the night before or anything like that. It's just a random selection of the players that will be asked to come and weigh in again on the morning of the event. 
when they weigh in the second time, obviously this is quite, whilst these have been in the rules for a while, it's obviously something that a lot of our BT coaches won't have encountered before. Um, so a random weigh in, when that happens, you don't have to be underneath your weight category again. You are, you have to be your weight category plus a 5% tolerance. So say if you're in minus 68, um, you can weigh in, on the morning of the competition um, in the random way. And I think it's something like 70.4 you can weigh up to, um, but don't quote me on those exact numbers. So there is a bit, there's a 5% allowance on the top of your weight category for the random weighing because they know that people are going to have gone away. They're going to have had a drink, have something to eat. But what the random weighing aims to do, aims to stop, is players extreme dehydrating, extreme dieting, going away eating loads drinking loads putting on five and six kilograms and then fighting the next day it's really dangerous for the player it's dangerous for the people they're competing against so that's why we do the random weigh-in good stuff okay so i got a scenario question here from jabril so uh, if you were to do a scorpion kick to the back of the opponent's head whilst coming out of the clinch without your hands touching is that okay no so if it's it because you've still you were in that you will have been in the clinch when you initiated the kick if it's if you're totally not in the clinch if it's you weren't in the clinch at all it's not connected to a clinch situation then that's fine but because you are in the clinch you're throwing that kick there's no real way to say whether you were out of the clinch at that moment so just no anything connected to a clinch scorpion kick kicks to the back of the head any kick to the back of the head wouldn't be okay so just to expand on on his question then so if we're in the clinch and then i push the person and then kick them in the head let's say in straight into the face is that okay yes if it's to if it's to the face if it's to the side of the head a crescent kick um an axe kick a uh, uh, bitch, I get absolutely fine. Um, what you can't do is the score. It's it's basically impossible to throw a scorpion kick whilst not in the clinch because it, it's not a scorpion kick unless you're in the clinch. So kicks to the back of the head from in the clinch, from coming out of the clinch, not okay. Kicks to the side of the head, to the face, absolutely fine, as they always were. How about these really acrobatic players who can do like a forward rolling somersault kick what what happens there because i know there's a few guys out there that that like to throw that one stop being a pain rick <laughs> <laughs> um it's not it's not a scorpion kick it's not a fish kick it's not if it's not to the back of the head it's probably going to be fine um what i would say is a lot of the time with those kicks there's been some sort of grab to be able to throw that kick um and then you'd probably get penalized for the grab as opposed to throwing a technique that you aren't allowed to use okay good stuff uh next question here uh when are these new rules going to start so these new rules, sorry, I should have said right at the beginning, um, the new rules will be implemented, I think it was on the very first slide. Um, so officially, World Taekwondo implement these rules from the 1st of June. We will be introducing these rules at the first cadet selection event. So from the 29th of this month, we'll be using these rules and then we'll be continuing to use these rules going forward. So from the 29th, uh, we're not swapping and changing uh, we're not doing some competitions on old rules some on new rules we thought well these cadet selection events are coming up the cadets need the practice on the new rules ready for the world championships and um, it's a perfect time to transition over um so from then stuff okay so next question here so this is relating to corner judges asking for ivr for a uh, spinning technique so mm -hmm. just for clarity, this can only be done if the coach has lost their card. Yes. Is that right? Yes. So obviously, um, if a corner judge pressed for a point, they can stand up and it's not gone on. They can stand up and ask for the points to be added as they always could. And But obviously two of them have got to agree. Um, where this using IVR comes into play is if two don't agree, if only one person saw it, 
um, and the coach doesn't have their IVR to to ask for it themselves, that person could use IVR on behalf of the player. But if you've got your card as a coach, then um, the referees can't, the corner judges, sorry, can't intervene or beyond their asking for a vote and two of them agreeing. Sure. No probs. Quite a few questions here that, is, uh, st- uh, that think uh, the questions are stimulating more questions, which is great. So um, regarding the uh, random weigh-in process, so there's a question here. So does this mean that athletes cannot eat comfortably after weighing, which doesn't help with the health and well-being of the athletes? So what I would say to that is if a player can't eat comfortably after weighing in, they are probably in the wrong weight category. Um, if they, If eating a normal meal and drinking a normal amount of food puts them over 5% above their category, then that is the wrong category for them. And that is why World Taekwondo introduced a random weigh-in. Um, players have, have died in the past at elite level so we're talking top we're talking athletes we're not just talking um children or people who do taekwondo as a hobby elite athletes have died from weight cutting um so this has been again they did loads of research into it what brought it in um to try and stop that extreme dieting extreme dehydrating um because if you basically they did research and found that 5% is the maximum safe, if anything is safe, amount to dehydrate into a weight category. Um, and anything above that you wouldn't is not acceptable. So yeah, if your player after eating and drinking after weighing in um, is going to be more than 5% above, then they're in the wrong category for me. Yeah, I'm just thinking it'd be pretty difficult to put on three or more kilos, even for someone my size, uh, you know, overnight. Uh, but yeah, good answer there. Obviously, Thank you. it depends on the weight. So obviously it's 5% of your weight. So if you are only in, if you're in minus 22 kilos, for example, like 5% of that weight is 1.1 kilos, which is quite a lot for a kid that small. Um, and if having a drink and having something to eat like I said, puts them over that, then they shouldn't be in that category to begin with. We shouldn't be getting kids that small um, cutting weight like that. Okay, no problem. So next question, different topic. So if someone, I'm going to slide the jibber back in. So if someone is kicking with the leg up, quite often their opponent will immediately bring their leg up. So will this be allowed under the new prohibited act of kicking the opponent's leg to impede their attack? Because this couldn't be, this could be quite open to interpretation, couldn't it? Yeah, that's actually not, not actually changed. So if, if I was kicking, um, if my, if I had my leg up kicking, provided I didn't do more than two kicks and someone brings their leg up and kicks my leg, um, it is open to interpretation. But if they intentionally attack my leg to try and bat it out of the way, for example, they will get an, a gam jump, um, for either lifting the leg or attacking below the waist, depending on what they what they actually did. And that's not changed. That's always been the case. Um, like you say, it is open to interpretation. It is angles, viewpoints. Sometimes players both lift the legs up and they do clash and it is unintentional. Um, but what we also see is sometimes every time a player comes towards them, a player lifts their knee up. And obviously doing that repeatedly, the referees will cotton on. And give the gam jump for that. Yeah. Okay. Just they always would have. So uh, another question here. So relating to the cadet heights piece. So um, Mm -hmm. concerns coaches are raising here is that you can have kind of like ten kilos difference between someone at the kind of like uh, like the bottom of that weight, effectively. Um, What 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 are your thoughts on that? Um, Yeah, you can. I, I don't there's not really a lot to say yeah it's possible it's possible um that is why they've brought in the maximum weights um because the maximum weights are basically um what is considered a healthy bmi for that height and obviously there's a massive debate over whether bmi is a good measure but that's what they've gone for so you shouldn't get players that are 
10 is possible obviously to get players 10 kilos lighter you do get some really tall skinny kids um or some short and heavier kids um it's just unfortunately the way it is the way world taekwondo have decided to to try this and you never know this might they might try it for a year and decide not to continue with it but they have all i can say is that they did do um, a lot of research has been done into this um and this is seen as being a safer fairer way um for players um Okay, so I've got another question here, and there's actually two answers to this question. <laughs> so, uh, if you attend a random weigh-in and you are overweight, um, what happens? I guess there's, there's two answers here, isn't there, depending if it's a major championship or a local event? So, um, if you attend a random weigh-in um, and you are overweight, then um, you're disqualified uh, because the draws have already been done at this point. Um, obviously... We won't, random weighing won't be used at, um, say, the Horizon Open, for example, competition, local competitions like that. We're talking about the bigger competitions, the competitions that have got that are selection events, for example, um, where players should be able to comfortably make that weight because they're trying to get selected in that weight for a competition that's happening six months down the line. Um, so, letter of the law world taekwondo rules if you fail the random way in then you're disqualified um but like i said we won't be using random way in at domestic events that aren't selection events or aren't bigger events for example okay good stuff so uh, quite a few questions here in terms of um when we are starting these new rules um so just to reiterate we're going to be using all domestic events from the 29th of May. So that does include the um, the cadet selection event and the under 21 selection event as well. So we're using it for both of those. There's quite a few questions asking about the under 21s. Um, but will these new rules apply this week at the European Championships, Jodie? Um, I believe so. Um, is... The only answer I've got, obviously, World Taekwondo Europe, um, sorry, that's my doorbell, um, will most likely use these rules. They're not officially implemented until the 1st of June, but I'd be very surprised if uh, they don't use them at the weekend. No problem. Quite a few questions here regarding the recording of this and this presentation. When can we get access to the recording and the presentation? So, um uh, British Taekwondo are uh, recording this and they're going to publish it um, as soon as possible, hopefully uh, tonight or tomorrow. And we can also send the presentation out uh, to all members as well. Um, next question. Uh, does a random weigh-in only apply for cadets? Um, no, so a random weigh-in... Um... I just obviously I use the cadet selection event as an example, um, but a random way can be used across um, all categories. OK, no problem. So uh, there's a comment here. So are we allowed to clash anymore? So uh, I think this is a terminology I'm aware of, but maybe not everyone on this call might understand what clashing means. Could you explain what that is, Jodie, and, and whether we're still allowed to clash? Are you there, Jodie? Not sure if Jodie's... Uh losing a signal there because we don't seem to be getting any audio through. So regarding the, the, the question, so are we allowed to clash anymore? So a clash is where someone is uh, coming at you with their legs up and people kind of exchange legs by kicking the leg or blocking with the legs. So no, it's not allowed anymore. So if you're trying to kick the other person 
then that is that is acceptable. But if you are deliberately kicking their leg um, to harm them or to block with the leg, then that's not acceptable. So that's that's a gam jump. Um, not sure what's happened to Jody's audio. So it's got uh, just a couple more questions. So um, yeah, I think we've I think we've lost a signal because the presentation's vanished. Um, so fighting a player who is twenty percent heavier than you cannot be safe. Um, well, that won't happen because they can only be five percent heavier, if that makes sense, uh, in standard weights. Uh, but I I do get the point though regarding the cadets. Uh, because it's based on height. So this is what World Taekwondo are wanting to do. Um, so we'll, we'll just have to wait and see um, yeah. uh, what happens Sorry, Rick, I'm back. I got kicked out and I don't I don't know why. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's fine, yeah. So I've just, answered the question on your behalf regarding the clash. Um, oh, we, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Did, um, if I, I, was, I don't know how much you heard of me, uh, of my last answer. Um, yeah, yeah, it's fine, yeah. yeah. But yes, um, just with regards to cadets, obviously, yeah, if they're using the height categories, they will still be checking um, that you're not um, over that maximum, more than 5% over that maximum weight um, for the height category. Um, and obviously, um, in the way in for cadets where height categories are being used, the height and weight will be measured. Yeah. Okay. Um, there are a couple of um, questions on there that are not related to this presentation. So I have left those out, but people can message me directly regarding any questions that we've not answered today. I'm just trying to keep to time because we've only got five minutes left. Uh, there are some questions there that are not relating to these new rules changes. Uh, I'm just checking that we've covered everything here. Um, and there's no more questions, I don't think. One second, one's just appeared at the bottom. So if you are throwing a chop kick and it ends up on someone's leg, would that be a gam jam? If you're, it would depend on whether, if their leg was up and you threw the chop kick onto their leg, then you would get a gam jam. If you were throwing a chop kick and they raised their leg and met your leg, then that's not your fault, that's their fault. So it just, it, it's not something that I can say, yes you can do it or no you can't do it because it's all it's very nuanced very in the moment of and very in the situation as to whether or not it's okay or not um but if generally if you were already in motion you were already throwing that kick and they brought their leg up and you and you happened to hit it that's their fault if their leg was up and then you and you hit it that's your fault no problem excellent right so uh, that's all the questions. Um, so I'm just going to hand back over to Richard. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jody, And thank you, Rick. And thank you to everyone who's joined us this evening. Thanks for all of the questions. As Rick said, if, if anyone has any further questions, then uh, please do fire them over in his direction. And I'm sure he'll be happy to... Uh, happy to assist. Um, once again, thank you everyone. Uh, the recording will be available um, as soon as possible and we will share the, the link with you. Um, apart from that, thanks again and um, have a good evening everyone. Thank you.